invite you to take your Bible. It's going to be looking at Mark chapter 11, beginning at verse 12 this morning. We're in the second week of a seven-week series. Pastor Ben started us last week. We're following through, as Mike mentioned earlier, with our Common Life book on We Would See Jesus. We're looking at the seven days of the Passion Week, uh, where Jesus, the final week of his life, we're going to be looking at that together. We're looking at Mark chapter 11, verses 12 and following today as we focus on Monday and Tuesday. Um, I wanted to mention to you before I get started this morning that over the next few weeks, we're going to be sharing um, requests for prayer for a number of very important, exciting, future shaping things related to our ministry. And we're going to be asking you to be praying with us regarding that. This morning, I wanted to mention a personal uh, request uh, that's coming up for me. Uh, five years ago, I was invited. We have a, we have a couple that um, our church supports, became friends with many of us, Doug and Karen Bradley. They were in the Middle East, missionaries with Campus Crusade, now called Crew. And Doug passed away um, a few years ago, after they had returned to the United States, they had started a ministry or were involved in a ministry to the United Nations. Um, Crew has, it has had uh, a headquarter, or, or has had a, an office and some real estate right there, right near the United Nations, a couple of blocks up. And they have a variety of events, Bible studies, many different ministries to ambassadors of the United States from other countries. Uh, shockingly, I was invited to go and speak, shockingly to me, to go and speak for an Easter dinner that they had. Um, Marin and I went up, and I spoke to this dinner of ambassadors from all over the world. It was an incredible privilege. Quite honestly, it was a uh, scary experience. Uh, I felt over my head. Um, and God mercifully blessed and, and used it, and uh, I truly felt literally driving away with that feeling, God, you did it again. You, you spoke through a donkey once in the Old Testament, and, and you pulled it off again. And, um, and I was very much grateful, fulfilled, and didn't feel a need to do that again. Um, and... <laughs> Last Christmas, uh, we were, I was invited again to go, and honestly, I'm being completely transparent, I did not want to do it. I, it's, it's, a, it's a nerve up, oh my goodness, uh, what do I say, you know, all these people from all different cultures, religious backgrounds, the whole thing, and they wanted me to present at their Christmas banquet, and um, fortunately, I had a scheduling conflict, um, but... Uh, a, a week ago, or 10 days ago, I was contacted again with the request that I speak at the Easter dinner. And uh, um, I really did not feel liberty to say no. I just felt the Lord said, the only reason you wanted, wouldn't do this is fear. And so I'm going. It is more fearful because they have moved the banquet, the dinner from their headquarters and the dinner is actually in the United Nations building. And I'm mentioning all of this with absolute sincerity. I am just pleading with you to pray. Um, I am, <laughs> you may say, well, Mark, this sounds a little false modesty. There is no false modesty in terror, okay? <laughs> there's, there's only terror. And so I'm asking you to pray. It's April 17th, Wednesday night. Um, and uh, it will be a presentation of what Easter is. Most of the people there are from non-Christian cultures, uh, many Islamic, many atheistic, uh, all, all different religious backgrounds. And I, I just really would be grateful to know that there was a, an army of people that were, were praying for me that, uh, that God will pull it off again. <laughs> okay. Um, our Common Life book is entitled, We Would See Jesus. And what we're doing in this seven-week series, and these, as Mike said, these daily readings tying in to what we're talking about each Sunday, and we're going through days of the week. Last week, Pastor Ben talked about 
the uh, triumphant entry. And all of this takes place in what is known as Passion Week, from the word pathos in the Latin. It means suffering. And you might think, well, that's somewhat disingenuous that you call a week suffering that starts with the triumphant entry for Jesus. Well, what you find, and we will find this morning, is when you get to Monday and Tuesday, things go south fast. And the chronology is that on Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey and was met and accompanied by crowds of onlookers and fans. After a brief visit to the temple, just to sort of look at things, case it out, he and his followers returned. They went to the eastern side of the city of Jerusalem, went over what is basically a hill called the Mount Olives, Mount of Olives, went, went over that, and then went to the town where they're staying called Bethany on the eastern side of the Mount of Olives. This morning, in our study, we will be looking at the events of Monday and Tuesday because the events are very much connected and entwined. Our focus in these studies is Jesus. It is Jesus' passion that we're looking at. It is Jesus that we want to come and know as we come towards the Easter celebration. But on Monday and Tuesday, Jesus compels us to look at ourselves. On these days, he does most of the public teaching for the whole week. On these two days, he shows by word and action that he has truly come to bring a new kind of kingdom. He reveals that many who are attracted to him, who perceive themselves as people of faith, actually don't get him at all. He declares they are not only blind, but to some degree dangerous, dangerous to the very purposes and values of his kingdom. And on these two days, Jesus forces people to look at themselves. He compels us to look at ourselves. Is our faith what he encourages or what he denounces? The events of Monday and Tuesday will help us know. As we come to this passage, we see declaring, in these, these passages, we will see Jesus declaring two things to people who profess to be of faith. One, that people of faith can be dangerous and blind. Secondly, that people of faith should be desperate and believing. We're going to look more at the first, but we will see both. Uh, and Monday, Basically, there were two main events that happened on Monday that are recorded anyway. The cursing of the fig tree on their journey into Jerusalem from Bethany over the Mount of Olives. And then the second, which took place um, somewhere midday, the cleansing of the temple. And I'd like to try to draw some insights from both of those. People of faith can be dangerous and blind. John, Mark chapter 11, beginning at verse 12, we read this down through verse 14. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any, tr any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Let's, let's pray together. Lord, we come to you this morning. Thank you for the gift of worship, the ability to respond in song, to pray, to give, to just corporately gather in order to be encouraged in our faith as our eyes are lifted from all the other stuff of life to you. God, I pray right now with so many thoughts and issues and concerns in life vying for our attention that we would be able to to see Jesus this morning as we look at this passage, in whose name I pray, amen. Here Jesus sees a fig tree. Looks something like this. It's a pretty robust fig tree, but that is a fig tree of the ancient Near East. Figs look like this when they're on the tree. And basically Jesus looks at this fig tree somewhere along the route over the Mount of Olives from Bethany down into Jerusalem, 
and he's drawn to it, and he goes to the tree, and the tree is in leaf, but it doesn't have fruit, and he basically denounces it, curses it, and as we'll see, the next morning, it, the whole tree is dried up and dead. This is one of the oddest, most bizarre, crazy incidents that Jesus is involved in, in, in all of the record. I mean, it sounds crazy that when anyone would curse a, a simple tree, I mean, what did the tree do to him? Well, the, the tree's just standing there, and, and yet Jesus curses, and it's, it's, it's an odd event. It's certainly crazy for Jesus to do this. I mean, out of character. It sounds petty. It, it sounds like he's indignant to this tree because he didn't get his fig. It's out of character with his miracles. Every other miraculous thing that Jesus did recorded in the Gospels had benefit for somebody else. Every one. Feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000, um, uh, the draught of fish, uh, um, changing the water into wine was even to bless the, uh, the host, uh, healing people, casting out demons, raising people. That everything was beneficial except killing this poor tree. You say, what is going on? Why is Jesus killing this tree? And what we learn in that is there is something very significant in this event because it is recorded multiple times in the gospel record. It's recorded Mark, Luke, Matthew. They, they record this event, and basically there is a teaching moment that Jesus is using through this event that is, that is of great significance. It's interesting. It's the first event he does once he starts into Passion Week after the entrance into Jerusalem. There are two big things we need to know to understand this cursing of the fig tree thing. Number one, we need to know that Israel is regularly represented by the fig tree in the Old Testament. It is a constant metaphor that is used of Israel. Immediately, when something is talked about with a fig tree, people would, rec in a teaching context, people would recognize it is usually symbolic of God's people when it is in the, in the Gospels. An example of that is in Luke 13, where Jesus is teaching. And he says this in verse 6 and 7. He says, a man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for it, for fruit on it, but it did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should we use up the soil? Now, before we leave that, the words that Jesus is speaking to a group of people, and he's, he's using this to illustrate this statement. And now here's the statement that just precedes that. If we can bring up that next slide. The words immediately preceding that parable are, unless you repent, you too also will perish. And he says, it's like a fig tree. If you don't bear the fruit that is expected, if your lives are not changed and your mind being changed by repentance, then, then you're going to be put aside. The blessing of God will be removed. The idea is you're the fig tree. You as God's people, as he's saying to the Israelites. The other thing we need to understand is, is the nature of a fig tree. When it says, because it's, it's weird with the wording, it says um, it is not the season for figs in, in Mark chapter 11, and yet Jesus curses the fig tree because it's not bearing figs. And you want to say, hello, this guy's doing his job. It's not supposed to have figs here, but here's the trick. Fig trees actually are like other plants. They, in, in some kinds, some of them, bear fruit before they bear leaf. Fig trees do that. They bear fruit and that, then, then they produce the leaves. And so you often have with a tree, it will start with some figs, but then it will also have foliage. And so when you see a tree in foliage, it means there are invariably figs associated with. This tree was apparently in leaf very early in the season. It was unusual. It was unexpected. So when Jesus went over, he anticipated there would also be figs on the tree. The idea he is condemning in is this. This tree is all show. It's no fruit. There should be fruit with the leaves. But there's no fruit. It's a metaphor of what he's saying about Israel. He's saying, this is my people. Yesterday, show Palm branches waved, people, the extravaganza, the multitudes, the crowds, not the religious leaders. They're still ticked off and, and distant from him. But he says, even those 
that welcomed us, many of them. It's all show. It's no fruit. And he's, he's warning the, the He's warning them, his disciples, don't assume that simply because there is the fanfare, the externals, that there is the transformation that I call fruit. You see, one saw Jesus for what he would do for their agenda. Awesome! I think he is the Messiah. I don't really understand why he's riding a donkey. I mean, I know that's Old Testament, so I guess there's a fulfillment part of that. But I wish he was riding a giant stallion, you know, with, with bells on it and, and, and an entourage of chariots. But okay, we'll take him. And he's here. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. Uh, Hosanna! He's here. But the idea is he will come and conquer Rome for us. He will make us great. He will make us greater than, better than the religious leaders' perspective, perhaps, as they are in open antagonism, but misguided, misdirected, as they anticipate he is going to do their own expectations for him. The true followers of Jesus saw what Jesus would do for God's agenda, that Christ, your kingdom come. Your will be done here in the same way it's being done in heaven all the time. His kingdom is for those who are willing to embrace his message, who are willing to have the, the fruit of repentance changed, who are willing to embrace the teachings of Christ that he has given continually in his three years of ministry, who are willing to die to themselves and willing to deny themselves and longing to seek the glory of God not seeking to use him for their own agenda. To be a all show and no fruit is to say, I want, the tr I want what Jesus can do. I want Jesus to bless my agenda. But Jesus says, those that are the true figs, the fig trees, that bear the fruit, that really embrace what I'm about, recognize that there can only be one king on the throne of a person's life. And I have come to be that king. The picture that he presents to us is many of the crowd were show. They gathered along the pathway. They embraced the moment of excitement. But the kingdom that he is offering to them is not a path that will lead them to power, to prominence, to self-advancement or world's glory. It is the path that will lead them to surrender. Humility, generosity, brokenness, sacrifice, and a gospel which says, come to Christ and he will give you everything you want is a false gospel. The gospel says, come to Christ and he will be everything you need. It is diametrically opposed perspectives. And Jesus says, one is show, but there's no fruit. There's still the desire to be enthroned on my life that now Jesus, yeah, he'll give us what he wants, conquer Rome, make us greater than. He says, no. What Jesus brings is, is, is a kingdom where he's the king. He's enthroned. He is the one that we deny ourselves and say no to our own aspirations, ultimately that we say yes to our king. They prioritized world's values. Secondly, and we see this now in the other event of that Monday, they pursued, many pursued what the world pursued. Here's what we read beginning at verse 15 of, of Mark chapter 11. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables and the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise to the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you've made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when evening came, this is Monday, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city back to Bethany. Jesus goes into the temple. He'd cased it on Sunday. And now Monday he goes to the temple, and this is the hub of all the activity of, of Jerusalem and the people of God. And the temple looks like this. 
And the temple, basically the, the middle structure is the temple itself and that large rectangular area with the courts on the two sides is the area that's called the Court of the Gentiles, this whole big thing. Right here in the front, which is actually eastern side of Jerusalem, is what is known as Solomon's Porch. It's about 30 feet wide and very, a few hundred feet long, and it's the place where the early church gathered. The book of Acts tells us they would gather under that portico in that long rectangular space and have their worship experiences. But this whole area is the temple. And what was happening in the, in the court of the Gentiles, these two big areas here, is where they set up their tables. And, and they, they brought, you know, perhaps hundreds of tables because there were thousands, some say tens of thousands of people squashed in there. And they would be selling the various animals for poor people. There would be doves and birds for people that had more money. There would be various animals all the way up to if you could afford sheep and, and, and uh, goats for your offerings. And basically, they're selling, and they got animals everywhere. I mean, it's wild and, I was going to say woolly, I didn't, but, but it, um, it's crazy in there. And Jesus comes in, and he's already cased it out the day before. He knows what it looks like. And he comes in, and all of a sudden, in the midst of these thousands of, of, of people, he starts turning tables over. And I mean, people are scurrying around. There's coins flying everywhere, animals bleeding. I mean, it's wild. The whole place is getting quiet as they're watching this madman do his thing. Why? What's he doing? He says, basically, you've robbed the temple of its whole function. He says, you have made it a den of robbers. This statement is actually a specific quote of an Old Testament book. It's from Jeremiah chapter 7. In Jeremiah chapter 7, uh, the prophet Jeremiah is rebuking the leaders of Israel and the influences of Israel. And he says, you, you know, you, you've, you, you're doing this. He says this in verse 5 of Jeremiah 7. You're oppressing the foreigners and the fatherless and the widow. How were they doing this? The next verse says, you have made this house has become a den of robbers to you. What does he mean? He's saying this temple... This center of our faith is to be a place that is known as a, as a refuge, as a caregiving place for widows and the fatherless and the oppressed and the foreigner and the alien. And you've turned it into a, a place to, to bilk them, to take from them. It's not a place of giving and care. It's a place of lining your pockets. Now we fast forward hundreds of years later to Jerusalem again in the time of Jesus. And Jesus walks in and he says, you're doing it again. This place is supposed to be a, a place of prayer for the nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. What is he saying? He's saying this which is to be a caregiving place for people, a place of worship, yes, but also a place of benevolence, of generosity. You've turned it into a place where you can in the... In the in the verbiage of God, you're just lining your own pockets. You're pursuing your own agendas. Now, I'm sure the religious leaders would have responded to him something like, well, well, well I mean, come on, we're, we're, we're doing this. It's an expedient thing. You know, it's helping people out so they don't have to buy the animals out in the town somewhere. It's right here. We're probably, we're probably creating more worshipers even and we're doing it, you know, after all, this money is, is for God's work. But actually, it turned the focus from God. It turned the place from the priorities of God. It turned from a priority of serving to basically getting. In Jeremiah's day and now Jesus' day, people felt the poor were not their responsibility. The widows, the orphans, the afflicted, the aliens, they're not our concern. That's not the issue here. But Jesus says that's the very foundation of this place. There's a challenge to us to always remember that the spirit of generosity, the spirit of caring for those in need, the spirit of watching out for the alien and the oppressed 
the outsider, the fatherless, the widow, the orphan, is always deeply ingrained in the heart of God. We need to remember that in every part of our lives, including our political life, and just evaluate our motivation as we think about immigrants and poverty and affirmative action and just evaluate what is the spirit in this and let God then lead how he leads. But the spirit he's saying that he found in Jerusalem was that was turned to what's best for me? What, how do I look out for mine and me? And he says, this is not what my kingdom is about. My kingdom is about generosity. My kingdom is about kindness. My kingdom is about compassion to those who have less. To be known by generosity, compassion, neighborliness, brokenness is the path of Jesus. It's why Guatemala trips are beautiful when 36 adults Many of them give up their own vacation time and, and do it on their own dime to go and serve medical as well as spiritual needs, but, but many, much of it caring for the physical needs of people and God giving opportunity to give voice to that and the gospel as well along the side. It's why having a ministry as we do down at the Collingswood campus to immigrants is beautiful being able to teach them ESLs, English as a second language, teach them computer skills, teach them how to even uh, handle their finances and their money, where to shop, what to do. It's caring for those that, that God says, this is the heart of Jesus' faith. It's why in the early church in the Roman Empire, it was an absolutely accepted practice for Romans it was done all over the empire, not just in Rome, where literally if you had a child that was disabled, you literally left it out on the hills. I mean, you just put it out in the field, left it to die, some, because it was hard. People were squeamish to kill their own kids, so they would just leave them there. I mean, it was a regular thing. Infanticide is a real Roman practice. And it was the Christians that would go out there and, with, with homemade wheelbarrows and homemade stretchers and would go out and pick up the kids at night and take them home. It was the Christians that went through the plague-filled streets of the Roman cities when the Roman citizens would take granddad or mom or young John, whoever it was who was plague-infested, and literally put him out in the streets so the rest of the family would not be infested. It was the Christians that came bouncing along with their homemade wheelbarrows and loaded up the bodies, still alive, dying, and took them into their own homes. And why a guy named Pliny, who was a governor of a Roman province, said, what is it about these Christians that they will care for our needy in a way we will not? Christianity has always been, when it's not just show, but it's fruit, about compassion, about being involved with the needy, about looking out for the, for the, for the outsider, the outlier. And Jesus said, y you're running the whole temple program. You got this beautiful thing going. Man, you're making it expeditious to be able to get your right sacrifices, and it's simpler. But you've lost the whole heart of this place, which is to love and care and be a place of generosity. And what was the result of the temple practices of Jesus' day? Well, he says it here. They actually prevented the world from coming to God. In my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. He's quoting again from the Old Testament, Isaiah 56, verse 7. The only place where the Gentiles could pray was in the courts where the carnival was going on. They couldn't even get near. They couldn't pray. This, this is not a refuge of, of silence to meet with God. There was no teaching going on in the midst of the hubbub of this crazy place. And Jesus says, your practices that you call worship is actually prohibiting people from coming to God. We come now to the second day 
And he says, the people of faith should be desperate and believing. We're just going to touch this quickly. In the morning, they come to the withered fig tree. In the afternoon, he will go in and be involved with all afternoon temple controversies. It's a horrible afternoon. The evening, he'll then teach the Olivet Discourse, which is a prophetic thing talking about the time when the sheep and the goats, those that are true believers from unbelievers will be, will be uh, differentiated and so forth. But I want to just read verse 20 to 25. In the morning, this is Tuesday morning, as they went along, and they're on their way back to Jerusalem now, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to the mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that they, what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Now, Tuesday morning, this was one shook up group of guys. I mean, Monday morning, they came in after the triumphant entry, walking the same steps, same path into Jerusalem, you know, and the palm branches are still there. I mean, whew, great morning. The, the remains of the parade still lying around. They're not noticing that Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning, what they're remembering is what happened in the temple the day before where Jesus went in and turned the tables on everybody, where in verse 18 and 19 of Mark chapter 11, they recognized that the religious leaders were so smoking angry at Jesus that it said they were plotting how to kill him. They may not have had been privy to that exact conversation, but they sure saw the smoke coming out of the ears of these religious leaders. They knew what was what, and they knew what they were walking into Tuesday, and they were right. And so they're coming, and Peter says, man, there's the tree. I mean, no, no bug or disease did that overnight. Jesus that's a tree you cursed. And Jesus now takes that as a teachable moment, and he said, Peter, boys, have faith in God. The triune God can do anything. I think what he's saying is, and quite frankly, you're going to need us to, because you're going in over your heads. You're going in, and you're going to see opposition that you've never experienced before, and it's not only going to be this week. You're going, to, you're going to find it through your whole ministry in the years to come. Have faith in God. And he says, then you'll be able to move mountains. It was a symbolic statement. It's used in Isaiah 44, excuse me, Isaiah 40, Isaiah 49, and Isaiah 54. That same metaphor is used of moving mountains by faith. It's a picture that you can do anything. And it's a picture that, that you have a, a God who is supremely able to do anything that is needed to be done. He'll take care of you. Lean into him. He's giving them encouragement. He's talking to men who are feeling desperate, and he's feeding in their desperation their privilege to belief. It's here that I just want to take a quick look at what happens to Jesus in the afternoon. Because he is going to live out exactly what he is preparing them for. When Jesus walks into the temple in Tuesday, on Tuesday, he walks into total attacks. There are pockets of leaders of all different brands that are waiting. They're, 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 they're waiting their turn. They've gone to the machine. They've picked their number. And first, it is the, the uh, Sanhedrin leaders and, and the teachers of the law, it says. They come and they accost Jesus. And they're, they're, they're verbally attacking him in front of the people. Obviously, everybody's watching and listening. And they're taking him on and, and, and trying to bring him down. And, and you can read all about that in Matthew 21 to 23. But first, it's the chief priests and the rulers. And, and he responds to them in chapter 21 of Matthew, verse 31, with this amazing statement, which won him a lot of friends. He said, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. Okay, that was the first group. Now the next group comes. This one is the Pharisees, and they come. They're the ones that have the conservative law code, very zealous, very, very, uh, we, we know the Pharisees. 
And they come and they lay all their questions to him. And, and as soon as they, they're gone, he catches his breath and turns. And, and here are the, Sadduc- the Herodians. The Herodians are the, the secular Jews that actually were, were identified with Rome. And they really wanted to work with Rome in order to empower the nation more. And they come with their questions. And their questions are about, you know, well, who should we give our tax to, you or Caesar? And he outsmarts them with his answer. And the next group, it says, are the, Sanhedrin, the uh, Sadducees, the secular Jews. They're, they're devout, but their idea is there's no supernatural. They don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in miracles. And they've got questions. All these groups. Then it comes back. The religious leaders come back again. And the Pharisees, and they gather. You could just imagine this afternoon. I mean, this is the afternoon from hell. Just boom, 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 coming at him. And here's what he says. In Matthew chapter 23, it's called the woes. He pronounces seven woes on the the religious leaders and the the, uh, the Pharisees. And he calls them by these names. You are blind guides. You are white washed tombs. What that meant is on the outside, it's painted white, it looks good, but inside, death. He says, you are hypocrites, says that a number of times. You're snakes, you're brood of vipers. You say, man, Jesus, why? I mean, this seems pretty harsh. What he's trying to do is overturn the whole establishment. It's not just the tables. It's the whole system of, of, of what the people have been taught and saying this is not kingdom. It's not about power. It's not about uh, uh, personal righteousness and religiosity. It's about godliness in the inside. It's about compassion. It's about humility. It's about brokenness. It's not about pride. It's about broken people. It's not about power. It's about dependence. It's not about self-absorption. It's about self-sacrifice for others. And Jesus is willing to turn the whole establishment over, and we can sense the incredible animosity, conflict, hatred that he faced. When we look at Jesus Tuesday afternoon, I think we just need to love him. There's not a person in this room or watching online this morning that would say, you know what, I love conflict. I love it when people are mad at me. I love it when there's, you know, when I, when I go in the office and everybody hates me and, and we're going to have, you know, dis- I mean, if you are like that, I, I, I don't know, I don't even know what to say. I, <laughs> just, but for sane people, we don't want conflict. Neither did Jesus, but he's willing to take it on. He's willing to lean into the Father himself and say, I'm going to speak truth. And he didn't do what most of us like to do, you know, leave the, speak the truth and leave immediately afterwards. He didn't. He spoke the truth. He took the hits and spoke the truth. And then the next group lines up and oh, I got the next one. I got the next turn. Bang, bang, bang. Why is he doing that? Because he's loving people, because he wants them to know what's true, because he wants to overturn this, this, this religion that's false. And for those that are there that maybe they haven't completely immersed themselves in the Pharisee stuff or the Sadducee stuff, but it's still for them just show. They just want Jesus to be theirs and do their agenda. He's saying, no, even you, I've got to be Lord. I've got to be enthroned. But if I am, It will be a life of compassion. It will be a life of generosity. It will be a life of humility. And it will be a life where you will need to do, like I just told the disciples, trust in God. Lean into God. Find your strength in God. This way of faith that is exhibited by Jesus has a remarkable result. It's found in John chapter 12, verse 20 and 21. We don't know exactly when it happened, except it happened sometime, probably Tuesday afternoon. Here's what happened in John 12, verse 20 and 21. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, one of the disciples, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we'd like to see Jesus. These are the guys that have been pushed out 
of the place that is supposed to be prayer for them, prayer for the nations. These are the guys that have, have been, and they say, this Jesus, he's, he's trying to bring us in. He's, he's, he's reaching out to people. He's, there's, some, there's compassion. There's a willingness to take on what is unkind and ungodly. We want to see Jesus. It's always Jesus that people ultimately are drawn to see. Not how beautiful your church building is. Not how majestic your, your music program is. Not how stammering your preacher is or isn't. It's ultimately what draws people to faith is sensing the presence of Christ. We want to know more. Where do we sense him? Where do people sense him? Well, Jesus models for us what he asks of us. Faith that is dying to self, that is denying self, that is enthroning the Father as his will in our life. He models faith that it is about God's kingdom and not one's own aspirations. Faith that values the needy, the alien, the outsider, the oppressed. Faith like that is still the one that draws people to say, I want to see Jesus. Years ago when I was in Turkey, Marin and I were there with a couple of our boys. We were speaking uh, to uh, people from all over the world that were ministering in mostly formerly iron atheistic cultures or Middle Eastern uh, strongly uh, Islamic the theocratic governments. And I was talking to a woman who had a doctorate and she was now on staff with crew to her own country. We didn't even know what the country was because it was, it was too dangerous to say. But she was telling about how when she, she had been raised in a, in a culture, uh, was an Islamic culture, and she had, excuse me, it was an atheistic culture, and she had come to uh, get her degree in a, a, a I think it was Italy, and while she was there, somebody had given her a Koran, and she read it, and this was her statement to Mary and I. She said, and I read the Koran, and I read about a God that was a God of power, a God of might and conquest. And she said, I was not drawn to a God. She said, I knew power. I knew conquering. I knew using strength against people. I, I grew up in communism. I knew, that, that I knew how to use power. It wasn't, that was not what I longed for. And she said, then I had another friend give me a New Testament. And I read about a God who came among us in humility, who came to serve, who came not to be served, but to give his life for others who came to pour out himself. And she said, I had never met this kind of being. A God like this drew me. He won my heart. This is what Christ shows as the picture of his kingdom. It is what he wants his people to be, broken, needy, dependent, and therefore, Vessels the compassion of Christ can live through. We won't have people desiring and requesting to see Jesus because we've got it all put together ourselves. That just scares people. You don't want to be, those people aren't safe when they got it all put together. And No, it's broken people that say, I can make it because I'm doing life with somebody who loves me unconditionally, who's for me, who gave his life for me. And I'm a broken, needy, confused, fearful, worried person just like you. Jesus came and he says, I want to model for you the nature of my kingdom. So it's not just show, it's real fruit. And the beautiful result is that people said, man, we would see this guy. We would see Jesus. Lord, thank you for coming among us, Lord Christ. Thank you for, God, as I've, I've looked at Tuesday afternoon and I've really imagined what it was like in that temple 
I'm, I'm overwhelmed with gratitude that you came and you stood there and you took those hits and you spoke boldly in courage and in compassion. Lord, thank you for your passion, your suffering, that we could be free. And we love you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now go in peace to love and serve and enjoy this Lord.